Welcome, and thank you all for joining us for another live episode of Teachers for Teachers. I'm Dr. Dejana Figueroa, and I'm here with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Leah Haynes. Say hello, Leah. Hey, everybody. Happy to be here. Really excited about this conversation. Oh, my gosh. Tell me about it. We have an absolute amazing guest joining our conversation today. To start off with the introduction, I'm going to throw it to Leah because I think you can, you know, link him into the whole foundation piece. And then I'll give you guys some more details about like our amazing guests. Well, I'm, I'm so excited. Malik Ducard came to us about two and a half, maybe three years ago now as part of the merger with LA Makerspace. So Malik was on the board at LA Makerspace when uh, when we merged. And I, I mean, really, we brought Malik, uh, Sebastian, and uh, and Joe Zena from from uh, LA Makerspace board onto our board. Awesome, and we got Maya Stark, who is just an, a, a wonderful addition to the uh, to the staff. So, um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and give a little bit of Malik's background? Awesome. So it is such a treat to have Malik join us for today's conversation. Malik is the vice president of content partnerships at YouTube overseeing business development efforts for the platform's learning, social impact, family film, and TV partnership areas. Did you guys hear that? Hello. Prior to joining YouTube, he served as Senior Vice President of Digital Distribution for the Americas at Paramount Pictures, oversaw distribution of content to digital platforms. Super, super cool. A native of the Bronx, anybody out there from the Bronx, go ahead and do a shout out, hello. Earned a bachelor's <laughs> degree from Columbia University and an MBA from my alma mater, UCLA. Something that we didn't know before our little bit of research is that Malik is also an author, yes, that's right, people, a children's book author um, that won an award. It's called Henry's Big Win, and it was the winner of Jesse Redmond's Fawcett's Award for Best Children's Book. Hello. Not only is he amazing, like social impact, family films, TV, partnerships at YouTube, he's got enough time to write a children's book. That is a person after my own heart as a, as a, as a K-12 educator for sure. So we're really, really excited to have him here and to have him join our conversation. And today's topic, dun, dun, dun. Today's topic kind of, kind of, it's kind of a cool thing. We're, we're going to be talking about how asking the question, and we're going to be asking the question, um, does the, you know, the maker movement and theme education, does the power that we see happening in schools when it comes to the maker mindset and the maker movement and steam education, uh, can we find a way to use the momentum and power of that movement to address a meaningful pathway to a real movement in social justice in schools. So we kind of want to connect those two pieces. Um, me, from an educator's perspective, what does that look like in schools? Leah, from an organizational perspective, and Malik, for, from being just an all-time expert in everything, we love to- And a great dad. <laughs> love so to that was the other thing. Thank you. Way, way yeah. too nice, way, way too kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, Malik, you once talked about the fact that with your boys, you have a system of um, changing passwords and making them equations that they have to work together to figure out. And I want you to know that I share that with every parent and every teaching group that I meet with. And we do a lot of professional development and work with teachers. So you're getting around in, in our circles, too. <laughs> It's uh, it, well, one, hey, I, I'm so happy to, to, to be here, Leah, Dejana, you are both so awesome. And um, it's just, you know, t totally a, a, a pleasure and a blessing of it to be invited. So thank you. Um, and the, the it, was, it was specifically the Netflix password because, Dad, Dad, can I get the Netflix password? And I would just constantly change it. Sometimes they would figure it out, crack it. So it was kind of fun to turn it into uh, equations and um, challenge them to, to get it and try not to lock myself out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love to it. That My challenge. kid's looking at me in the corner like, don't do that, mom. Don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the maker movement's been a pretty important part of your life too, Malik. I think with your kids, uh, isn't that how you originally got involved with the LA Maker Space group? Yeah, um, you know, we we've always, you know, in the family, have loved to to build things and tinker, and and I think you know it it, it really started when. Um, I, I was a kid, you know, growing up in the Bronx. My mom was a, a teacher, a public school teacher, and she always really espoused being curious. And I didn't know what, you know, technology meant, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, like all of that. But what what she allowed for was me to break the house apart and to open up clocks and toys and see how things worked and tried to put them back together and um that that kind of ethos like really really fueled my interest in, in building and creating whether it's like stuff or stories um and you know i've had just you know great opportunities throughout life to to be able to to do that professionally and personally and um and when with my kids which is where it's like most fun um to to watch them create and explore and and challenge things and, and build things and and do you think it's influenced i know harris is harrison is on his way to morehouse this fall, yes. right so fall. do you do you think excited. that the mo the maker movement and what you've been doing on that has influenced his ability to uh to to get himself admitted did it have any influence I, I think I think that it it did. Um, you know, part of this whole application process, which was also a bit surreal, given the pandemic and you know everything was just you know upside down. Um, but you know, he was able to to really articulate that curiosity and things that he's built. You know, over the 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 years whether it was he, he 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 he's really into fashion for example so you know with that we tried to you know um support him when he wanted to do uh a fashion website of just like things that he liked with uh, a commerce element to it and you know he probably made like twelve dollars but got like value that was priceless so um, being able to to really talk about that in sort of his path and, you know, being involved with, you know, LA Makerspace and Two-Bit Circus Foundation and, um, you know, so many things that he's been a part of. It's been um, really great to see. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. I love I love those stories because it reminds me of how you said two things, like he was he was really passionate about things and he made things. And then he was able to tell the story of, what he was making right and that was super super valuable and that kind of hits on another talking point that i have is the importance of storytelling and like that intersection of when you're personally invested and in making and being really passionate about what you're doing how that translates into you becoming a better storyteller <laughs> to share yeah. that with someone else would you say that that's kind of what he experienced or like give us a little bit uh, I, I I think so because so so much of like things like what we make, what we design, what we use, they they all have stories behind them, and um, you know I think it's so important to to be able to 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 talk about the struggles of hey you know what when when I was working on this website um, I I spent you know, hours and hours trying to get this to work and, and it didn't like finished product ha have embedded in it struggle, overcoming um, uh, the ability to move from A to C and figure out B. So so I definitely think that storytelling is is so, so critical um, in in all of this and and i think also inspirational because when a person communicates a story um and and i share with you like here's the path that that i took and here are the roadblocks that that i hit it it makes it more attainable and more real 
because sometimes when you see the end product, you know, whether it's a thing, whether it's a person in a profession or a career, what's missing is all the things that it took to get to the final polish. Now, I, as, as a dad, you know, I've even been concerned in the past that like, you know, my kids might, you know, see something I do and think, oh my goodness, like that's unattainable or not, not that that's unattainable, but like that, like how, they just know me now. They don't know me then. So I, I did this thing once uh, and, and I'll tell you why I stopped doing it because it backfired. Um, oh. But, you know, back, you know, pre pandemic, you know, when I would drop them off at school and drive them to school, it was called mistakes, mistake Mondays. And as I'm driving, I would tell them about one like big life mistake that I made and and the lesson I learned from it and, and how it might have like knocked me back. But, you know, there's usually a moral of the story on, you know, and then I got back up. And But it was all about mistakes that I made. And, um, you know, it went well. And I think that they were learning from it. But then, you know, th this is not part of the moral of the story. It kind of backfired when like in, in just, you know, unrelated moments, they would bring up mistakes that I made when I'm trying to like, you know, discipline them or say, no, don't do that. They would quote a mistake from Mistake Monday. And I'm like, okay, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna need to now abandon Mistake Monday. Pause because... on Mistake Monday. <laughs> pause, pause on Mistake Mondays. Cause... Yeah, maybe better just to give general ideas. About... Yeah, general ideas, no, no specifics. No, but dad, you did. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like the premise, though, like, because I feel like sometimes adults and in my space as teachers, young people think we're perfect and they don't know our stories. And yeah. one of the things that happened during the pandemic when we went remote is my students came into my space, where my, my home place, and my face showed up in their home place. And we found that, that, that there was something about that because we started engaging in one another's stories on a level that hadn't happened in in at, at in-person school because you know we couldn't help it so so and so is walking in the background they hear my dog they hear my they become a part of my life and I become a part of their life and one of the things that I thought was really really powerful um, you know, good things that came from the whole remote learning experience is that I got to know my students and their home and their pets and their favorite things that are in their house on a level that I just, in my entire 16 year career, I, I, I really never connected on that level before. But virtually going into their space, I think we, we started sharing more stories. It was really, it was a really interesting thing and then that helped us get through the challenges of associated with you know remote learning so that whole story piece I, it's new to me as a science educator but i'm starting to realize that really i'm a master educator but i also want to become a master storyteller because that's going to really transform how i can interact engage and inspire my young people for sure. Yeah. So I love how our conversation went that way, because that's that's a growth area for me as an educator that I want to share with our audience out there for sure. That's a takeaway. Science teachers now realizing that uh, instead of being a master scientist, which I am too, I need to be a master storyteller. And what, when I was practicing full-time science with my PhD or whatever, what if I was a master storyteller then maybe my science would have had more impact on policy and legislation if I could accurately and get like really tell this story in a way that's meaningful to a variety of audiences. So that that piece is super, super important to kind of share. Just wanted to, yeah. like, that's what came out of the yeah, top of my head. I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you. And I think one, one, one two, two thoughts, like one, one question now is you know pandemics you know bad um but we've had these silver linings of like hey seeing things a little bit differently there are these new opportunities to connect and tell stories how, how do we capture and retain some of those silver linings some of the 
like, hey, you know, you're in my home, you know, the other person's in your home, et cetera, and, and breaking down those kind of borders to, to open things up more. How do we retain that when we get back into um, whatever the new normal is going to be, I think is a, a question. Um, but the, 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 yeah, sorry. Say, that's a captivating, like that is exactly what I'm sitting on right now. And I bet, I bet you that's not just my experience, that's educators yeah. everywhere are really trying to ponder what am I going to take? What what magic that did happen? How can I how can I take that into the new normal of my classroom? Because that yeah. that I don't want to lose, but yeah. it's it's new, so <laughs> we have to kind of trailblaze a pathway for for bringing that. But yeah, I'm sitting on that too. Leah, do you have any thoughts there? Well, I, I think the same thing that it, there are some real treasures that we have to hold on to moving forward. But I want to go back to the storytelling part for a minute and ask Malik, what what got you started on the children's book? Like, where did that come from? Oh, you know, I, I, I've always loved writing. Um, I've always loved telling stories. You know, this is, you know, yet again, another thing that um, came from my mom. You know, she planted those seeds. And uh, so, so it's actually, I can't not do it. Like, I, I love to, to make narratives. So it's just something I've been doing my, my whole uh, life. And uh, before I wrote the, the the children's books, I, I, I actually wrote a science fiction novel, uh, ebook. All these things are self-published, and um, for me, moving moving from this like kind of like kind of strange. Don't don't go out and get it. <laughs> is my advertising, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, moving from like science fiction to the, the fantasy of of science fiction, fantasy but grounded in realities of human nature moving to children's book the fantasy uh, but grounded in human nature like it wasn't a leap um and and in fact like th there was a period of time going back to my kids where i would actually read them their bedtime story would be science fiction um short stories uh and not you know quote unquote children's books and and th there wasn't a big leap like it was pretty seamless because it was all the fantastical uh so the the, the children's book you know it, it that just came out of um you know stories that you know help that the, the, that the kids really came up with it was their stories and um you know there there, there was one that happened to my youngest kid that i decided to write uh something that happened to him up until like page five and then it goes out on a different journey and that kid still asks for for royalties on, on the book. <laughs> <laughs> but um, w w w was inspired by them <laughs> so my only experience of your writing malik uh was a profound experience but it was the letter that you sent out um close to the the beginning or middle of the pandemic when you took the boys to one of the marches and you wrote a letter uh that was so eloquent and so um profound i sent it out i mean for the audience malik is our board president and i sent the the article out to all of our our board and i think the response was was the same from everybody that it was just so beautifully written that and and you know, it was the Black Lives Matter uh, march that was going on. And so it was really helpful to read oh, and you. see how you were handling it with your boys and what you were saying to them. So I really, I thank you for that. But I, well, I did I have an experience of, of your writing that was profound. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So what's the younger son uh, doing, uh, Malik? I mean, will it be hard for him to have his older brother gone for the year? Um, I don't think that they, you know, the, the two younger ones, I don't think they know what's going to hit them. Um, right. You know, when their older brother goes off to, to school, like everyone's just like, except for the parents, like right. kids are just <laughs> going about their lives. But it, right. it's, it's going to be a pretty pretty big change but they're cheering him on mm -hmm. uh, and yeah I, I, I think uh, I think they'll be all okay they have um, 
they have their their gaming to to keep them in game. <laughs> but, you so know, I, I missed know. one here. How so? How what are the ages? I thought you just oh, had two boys. So no, oh, so three three boys, twelve, sixteen, and eighteen. About to actually, the twelve is about to be thirteen, and the eighteen is about to be nineteen. So in a month, in actually two or three weeks, I'm going to have three teenagers in the house at once. So it'll be like that one. I'm sorry. Month. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in the middle of the tunnel, at the bottom of the tunnel. We just want to get to the other side. I can't wait. Is that the name of the book? Get to the other side? Get, I, get I, to I the other side. That's, 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 the, that's the next that's the story. That's yeah. And Dejani, you must be relating because you've got two teen, two legitimate teenagers and one almost a teenager. <laughs> They're early onset. So I'm just starting this journey. So I just kind of have my first view of this tunnel. And I, <laughs> I, I think I want to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I you know can't that's back not awesome. you. It keeps <laughs> pulling you, you deeper in. It's uh, not a tunnel. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Some sort of thing, yes. But um, yeah, I'm at 14, 12, and 10 right now. 14, 12, and 10. Wow. 14, 12, and 10. So I look at you and I'm like, oh, that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and look, Malik seems to be surviving it really well. So, right? I'm, I'm, so an I'm an avatar. I'm an avatar. This is actually not Malik. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's, you know, it's a journey. It's just different. It's a different journey yeah. than the previous 10 years. And the good thing about this time is that, you know, at the end, they come out and we went through, like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm still here. <laughs> it, it, all, it, all, it all works it out. It all works out. But I love it how you said they still have gaming. My kids yeah. are on. I'm trying to keep up with them. So their lives are now. It was, you know, when we were a kid, we got cell phones. So we used to call each other. And that was a big thing. And then the next generation was all about texting and not calling. But now these kids have Discord and all these other things <laughs> that keep them yeah. connected like all the time. So yeah. it's just it's a learning, <laughs> it's yeah. a learning curve. I, with, with, um, with one of them, I, so they're, they're, they're super like uber connected and, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been good from that standpoint during the pandemic in that they're able to communicate. Although sometimes it's like, you know, I wish I could like separate out, you know, some of the the connection time uh, versus some of the other time that I feel like sometimes they're just burning a little bit. Um, but I, I go into to, to the room and he's playing this game that like, you know, I'm not too thrilled about. I think it's like not, not a great rating, you know, to be, but, but, and, I, and I'm about to shut it down. And he goes, dad, th this is the role play server. And I'm like, okay, tell me more. And I learn and I see that he is actually in a courtroom and it's, there's a judge, there's a jury, defendants, prosecute, like the whole thing. And they're all like actual people and like I listened for a while and it actually gets like boring because it's just like some kind of like rote um, uh, process that they're going through. But as I dug in more, I realized that in this role play server, they um, uh, want to kind of replicate real life in law and all sorts of things and they play it out. And it's not like a violent thing. I mean, maybe some things happen like that, but they're, they're, they're um, uh, learning like law. And my son says, I'm, I'm trying to work up my points to become a lawyer in this world. And, and then it hit me, you know what? The next Supreme Court justice, chief justice or whatever is probably playing this right now and is getting inspired. And this is where it's happening. They're just using gaming, uh, the, the, which gaming, which I, do think is great, but they're using what 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 they're on right now as the platform for something so much bigger and greater. So it was um it was an eye opening moment for me. Yeah, That's what a great awesome. use of cosplay for the for the kids, right? right? Exactly. That's so funny. 
funny, Emily, because about a year ago till the day, <laughs> actually July 14th, we had Nolan Bushnell on this show exactly a year ago today. And um, he was talking about using game design and, and gaming like as a real education platform for learning in, in a way that hasn't been done before. And I think what you just observed and what you were describing is a great example. Like our future Supreme Court justice got their start in that role, you know, that role playing game. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. You know, it reminds me too, I this week sat in on some of the Games for Change Festival uh, in New York, and they had someone on, a professor who teaches game design, with a journalist who had just spent six years investigating um, dictatorships that had uh, been accused of corruption. And so there were six different countries that she had done all this investigation. And so seven years, all of this material, the game design group turned it into a learning journalism game for oh, wow. the, the players and it's like yeah like we are on the, the brink of that being the next generation like the games that exist now some of them are are good but for the most part when kids start playing educational games they know immediately this is an educational game this is not a game whereas if we get the actual game designers working on building the game side of it we can supply the curriculum and we just actually got our, have been hired for the first uh, uh, version of that to put together five uh, projects that can be like four week long programs that can be delivered digitally that are educational uh, gaming. So we're you know, we're excited to be a part of it. And we are doing the curriculum side of it and game designers will then take and build out what the uh, what the game should be. But it is the future of education. There's no reason to have a lecturer at the front of the room, especially with children, like with little ones, They're, having them engaged in doing, which is why the maker movement has been so important in education. I was watching something the other day with a physics teacher in Michigan who's teaching physics to her freshman high school class with dirt bikes. So what kid isn't going to want to learn physics yeah. if you yeah. actually go out and ride dirt bikes to learn the uh, the game? and. I was telling it to uh, one of the gals, Amber, that we work with, and she said, wow, when I was in high school, I was all excited because we actually went outside to watch a slinky to learn physics. And she said, that was the best day of my school life if I could have been on a dirt bike. But that's the, you know, engaging the kids where they are. It's what we're trying to do with all of the uh, maker uh, spaces that we're putting in the schools and, and the work that we do with teachers is really to try and get them to engage in learning by doing instead of by telling. Yeah. I, I so when Nolan, when, when Nolan was with us, it, one of the things he said that when he was taking his kids on a long journey, one of the ways he kept them from fighting was he would give them all a poem and tell them if you uh, mo memorize this poem, by the time we get to our destination, I'll give you $5. He said, I was going to give them $5 spending money when they got there, whether they did the poem or not anyway, but it was a way of keeping it. I wondered, Malik, if you have anything that you've done with your kids that is the, like, okay, this is what we do when we're in that situation. Um, I don't have anything, I don't have anything like that specifically, no. Um, you know, like with, 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 long drives because of devices like they're they've kind of got their it's a different age so yes. you know, they've got stuff portable but 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 I, I will say tapping into like their natural inclination to be creators to be makers like the hands-on as you were saying um is 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 really something I think can be unlocked more. So I had this one experience with my, my middle son uh, a few years ago who loves to create videos and um, share videos and, and he, he, he's, you know, a builder uh, and, and he was having trouble in his math class. I, I think it was the Pythagorean theorem or something like that. And, and, you know, I was trying to help him after I had to relearn it myself and uh, he still wasn't getting it and then i thought you know what he likes to make videos like why don't you make a video of like how to do it and he said okay so i took the phone 
I hit record and, and all of a sudden like he like comes alive. He's a little bit of an introvert, but not when the camera's rolling. He's like, What is up, YouTube? I'm gonna teach you how to, you know, to, to and he's like being like an uh, uh, we call them on YouTube. Uh, where, where I work, um, uh, edutubers, educational creators on, on YouTube, and they're, they're such a wonderful community, and he loves them. And so he's doing, like, he's teaching how to do the Pythagorean theorem as an edutuber. And as he's going through it and writing the stuff on the paper, the moment he hit the wall that he was hitting before, one, he realized that he hit the wall and he looks at the camera and he goes, oh. And then we did another take and he got the whole thing right. And then the next day he went into class and he isn't the first kid to raise his hand when you know teacher says, does anyone know? He was the first kid to raise his hand when the teacher asked, can someone show me how to do this? And it's because of that feeling of empowerment he'd gotten the day before. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think connecting it to some of what is just natural and what they desire, what they want to do, um, is you know can can help. Right. This has been such a fast half hour, Dejana, that I think we're out of time again. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you have good conversation, good people, good topics. What are you going to do? Well, what can I say? Before we say goodbye, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Malik for joining us for this conversation. We so appreciate you being here and sharing your stories and, you know, your time. So thank you. So thank much. you. Uh, thank you. Such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to your audience and, and uh, to everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Malik. Bye, everybody.